Kubernetes. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm here to talk about uh, Kubernetes. So how many of you have played with Kubernetes before today? How many of you are running Kubernetes for real in production? So the scary point of that is that there are people in the crowd listening to a developer's introduction to Kubernetes while running production systems on Kubernetes. I have opinions about that, but who cares? So my name is Chris Liu. Uh, I work at a company called Active Solution. Um, I've been doing web development for 20 plus years. You don't care. I work at Active Solution. I do suggest we have a booth right outside. Right outside. Uh, there's a tree. Uh, there's a bowl of pictures of people working at Active Solution. If you go and pick one of those up and you put it on the little board with a tree, we will plant three trees in uh, in Ethiopia, and we'll give away money to some other uh, charity as well. So if you want to do something good, go and put a sticker on a tree. I don't know. That's what they told me to say. Anyhow, I've got a ton of things to cover. So. Docker is pretty cool, right? I got started with Docker a while ago, and Docker is really awesome. Uh, it simplifies the way that we work with our systems. However, for running production workloads, Docker is a bit limited. This is pretty much as far as we can go with Docker. We can say, I want to run a container, and I can limit the memory, and I can limit the CPU-ish. It's not actually being quite limited, but it's, it's an attempt to limit it. And I can tell it that if the container fails, please restart. That's what I can do. If you want to run something more complicated than one container in production, then Docker is going to be quite hard for you, because you're going to have to manage load balancing and all that stuff on your own. So that's where Kubernetes comes in. And Kubernetes is something called an orchestrator. So I have to Google what does orchestrate actually mean. If you Google it, it says to arrange or score music no, Plan or coordinate the elements of a situation to produce a desired effect, especially, I'm not going to try to pronounce that word. Um, and this is what it does, it, it arranges stuff. You tell it how you want your environment to look, your desired state, and then Kubernetes goes ahead and solves it for you. Cool thing is when you Google a, name, a, a word like orchestrate, you get this graph saying it's telling you how often it's been used. Can you see the end there? We are making it go up at the end because orchestrating is something we've started doing more and more. And I think Kubernetes and things like that is why we're getting that thing at the end. And I thought, awesome, I am part of that. I'm on a hype curve right now. Then you go and look further and it's actually way down. Um, having that said, this comes out of books. So it's not how much we talk about it, it's what books are being written. Who the hell writes books about this? Um, so, we're going to talk about Kubernetes, uh, and I'm going to leave the, the, the graphs on, on the side. But before I'm going to show you how to actually do some Kubernetes stuff on your machine, I want to talk a little bit about what Kubernetes is. To me, it's been really important to understand what is Kubernetes, how does it work, what does it do under the hood, why is it magical. I hate things that are magical, because things that are magical tend to break. And when you release the magic out of something that's magical, it's gone. You can never get that magic back in again. So I learned that Kubernetes is built up on different machines. You have a cluster of physical or virtual machines. That's part number one. We split those groups or those machines into two groups. Uh, we have a smaller group called the master nodes uh, or the control plane. So a master <coughs> node is part of the control plane. So I'll be using those back and forth. Uh, they're the same thing. And uh, master nodes is what we talk to. That's where kind of the smarts is from a, well, a basic point of view. It's not really where the smarts is, but it's what looks like the smarts. And that's what we're talking with. We talk to the master nodes, and they then tell our worker nodes, which is a much bigger number of, of uh, uh, machines in our cluster, to do the work. They were used to be called minions, which is way cooler than worker nodes, but they renamed that. I don't know. Minion Union came and said they didn't like that, something like that. <laughs> Uh, one other thing, so normally you split this up, so if you're running your own cluster, you will have probably two or three master nodes. You need those load balance, because if they go down, they kind of disappear, your cluster is screwed. Uh, and then you'll have a bunch of, of worker nodes. However, if you do move to the cloud or to some, some service that allows you to run Kubernetes as a service, 
the master nodes and the, the control plane is generally replaced by something that the cloud offers you. So if you go to, uh, to Amazon, you get EKS. If you go to uh, Azure, you get AKS. If you go to Google Cloud, you get something else. I think it's called GKS. Um, makes sense, I think. Except for Amazon having EKS, but yeah. everything is elastic in, uh, in Amazon. And uh, that means that we don't have to care about that part, which is really nice. They will give us the control plane, we can communicate with it, but we are responsible for the cluster nodes. So I've only worked with Azure uh, from an AKS point of view, um, and that means that you actually get VMs. They will give you a certain number of VMs, you can scale it up and down, but there are actual VMs in your, your service. So let's have a look at what the control plane does. Uh, but before we do that, we kind of have to understand this idea of desired states. We do not tell the control plane what to do. We don't go and say, spin up machines, just run containers, do X, do Y. We go to the control plane and we say, this is what I want my cluster to look like, and then the control plane and Kubernetes kind of magically sorts it out. So desired state is really important as compared to do X and Y for me. So before we go in, very high level overview. There are technical details that might not actually be true in what I'm telling you, but it's the way that I look at it when I look at the Kubernetes cluster. So the control plane is, is this thing here. We've got a user, uh, an admin of some kind. Uh, the admin creates a desired state configuration, which is basically just saying, I want X number of containers running in my cluster. That is being sent to a REST API inside my control plane. So one part of the control plane is a basic REST API. It's all based on just a REST API. If you send stuff to the REST API, you can read stuff from the REST API. It's all secured. Uh, and then it takes the, the REST API takes your desired state configuration and stores it in the database. It's, it's called ETCD. Uh, it's a document database. And that's pretty much all that happens. That is what you're doing. Once you've put your desired state into the database, there is something called the Cube Controller Manager that runs on each one of the, the worker or master nodes. And it will then continuously ping and query the REST API saying, is there anything new? Is there anything I should know about? Is there anything new? Is there anything I should know about? And when you've uploaded your desired state configuration, the Cube Controller Manager will go and say, ooh, there's a new desired state configuration. I need to figure this out. I need to figure out what I need to change. The Cube Controller Manager is actually a bunch of smaller controllers. The one that will pick this up is called the Scheduler Controller. It picks up the new side desired state configuration. It goes and asks the REST API what worker nodes are available in the cluster, how many pods are running on the different nodes, what's their, their utilization at the moment. Based on that, it figures out what nodes should be responsible for running the workload I just set up. So which, what nodes in the cluster should run container X, Y, and Z. It puts that information into my the state configuration, puts that back into the database. That is what the worker uh, the master nodes do. If you don't have any worker nodes, that is all that's going to happen. You're going to have stuff in the database. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Not that impressive. And then there's going to be a REST API on top of it. But what happens then is that you have your worker nodes, uh, and they will sit on the sides. So they're a different group. If you go to AKS, for example, they will even be put into a separate resource group. So they're on their own. They're just minions doing their, their stuff. On the worker nodes, you have a container runtime. I did choose an, a logo for Docker, because Docker is what you normally get in your worker nodes. But it is actually just a container runtime, so it doesn't need to be Docker. You can go ahead and you can use CRIO, or you can use container D, or you can use Rocket, or whatever other container runtime you want to run, because the runtime system is standardized. So you can pull Docker out and put something else in. Cool enough is that container D is actually part of Docker as well. It's just Docker is container D with other stuff on top of it. But as I said, most of the time, you will have Docker in there. Besides the runtime on that node, you have something called the kubelet. So a kubelet is a piece of software running on each one of the worker nodes that is the smarts of Kubernetes. It asks the control plane, it basically pings the or pulls the REST API continuously saying, are there any uh, containers that should run on, on me? Is there any containers that I should set up? And when it gets a container that needs to be set up, it talks to Docker and tells Docker, hey, can you please run this container for me? So it, Kubernetes doesn't run any containers at all. 
Docker or your container runtime runs your container, the, the thing that Kubernetes does is make sure that it tells the container runtime to run container X, Y, and Z for you. And then there's a, a little thing called the kube proxy. Not to mention a bunch about that, but networking inside of Kubernetes is complicated to say the least. There's a bunch of IP table routing and stuff that you generally don't have to care at all about. But it all runs through a process called kube proxy that will proxy every network request inside of your, uh, more or less inside of your cluster to make sure that you can communicate between your nodes in the proper way. That's it. Now you know Kubernetes. <laughs> 11 minutes in. I'm doing good time here. There are, however, small building blocks that we kind of need to know. Uh, as with every piece of technology that we use, basically, there are, there are building blocks that we put together. Very few of us will actually build the system from proper scratch. We have these building blocks and we'll pull them together in different ways. Kubernetes is the same. The smallest part we get to play with is called the pod. Nope. In Kubernetes, there is no such thing as a container. From, a, from an organizational point of view. You never set up a container, you set up a pod. A pod is one or more containers. The cool thing about having a pod instead of containers is that you can actually bunch them together. So you can have multiple containers in one pod, but you can also run one container per pod if you want to. But it gives you some benefits. So to be perfectly honest, I think probably 90% or more of your pods will be single container pods because you only want to run one container inside of one pod. But pod is what we're talking about when we're scaling. You scale a pod up and down. So they share a few resources inside the pod. So they share an IP address. So if you put multiple containers in one pod, they cannot expose the same ports because they're going to be overlapping. So they're just going to have one IP address for the whole pod, and then you can use different ports on that IP address. Please, for the love of everything that is sacred, do not start talking to your pods using their IP addresses. I'm just saying that they have an IP address, but it's an ephemeral thing that pods will go up and down, and every time they get re relocated or changed or whatever, they're going to get a new pod. You do not talk to your pod using IP addresses. You're saying that they have one. They can do inter-process communication. They are literally running together in the, the same process namespace, so you can basically talk between them uh, through process, between the processes. Um, and they can share data. So if you give them a volume to store data in, that volume can use, be used by all the different containers. Very common scenario is something called a sidecar container. It means that you have a pod with two containers. Container A does the workload, but it logs everything to storage, and then you have a, another container in the same pod that reads storage and takes care of the logs and propagates the logs to whatever log stashing system you have. So you, you'll have two containers, but there's one doing work and one doing log stashing. The important part is you scale pods together. So a very common mistake when you start out with Kubernetes is you look at this and you go, pod can have many containers, sweet, I'm going to set up my first um, blog, I'm going to do a WordPress site, uh, WordPress needs a database, that's two containers, how about we put them in the same pod? They build them together, they can communicate, they're always going to be together, they're going to be really quick to talk to each other. Yes, and then you scale it up and you end up with two WordPress sites and two databases, or ten. And then you go and you add a blog post to one of your, your uh, sites that ends up in one database, and then every tenth time you refresh your website, you end up getting the blog post in every other case it doesn't exist. So do not think of this as, hey, I want to group them together because they belong together. You want to group them together because they scale together. If they don't scale together, they're different pods. If they do scale together, they're the same pod. So it's all about scaling. But let's go a uh, slightly more practical and look at actual code. Actually, I'm not going to go code, I'm going to show you a Windows desktop thing. Uh, how, getting started with Kubernetes is actually really simple. If you have Docker for Desktop installed on your machine, and if you don't, go and install it. It's a quick download, install it, everything is fine. Uh, you go into Properties, there is a Kubernetes node, and you go and you just tick the Enable Kubernetes, and all of a sudden you have a Kubernetes cluster on your machine. It's the worst piece of crap cluster in the world because it is one node, your machine. Actually, a virtual machine on your machine. And it combines worker nodes and a master node into the same node, which is a big no-no. Uh, and a bunch of other things like limiting that it's just one machine, but it allows you to use 
Kubernetes. You can issue any Kubernetes command that you want to. It is a fully working Kubernetes cluster, although I don't want to call the cluster with one machine. Once you've got that installed, you also get kubectl. Kubectl or kube control uh, is the tool that you use to communicate with your cluster or your control plane. I said that it was all HTTP based in REST, and it is. The thing with kubectl or kube control or cubicuddle, as I prefer to call it, I love that name. Cubicuddle, can you please cubicuddle that for me? Yes, I will cubicuddle for you. Um, it will make sure to do the HTTP stuff. So you don't have to manage authentication, signing, and all of that with your requests. You don't have to do HTTP requests and posts and puts and all of that and know the URLs you need to pass it to. Cubicuddle will know that for you. So all you need to do is you pull up your cubicuddle command. Really poor view of that, but okay. You go cubicuddle, whatever you want to do. So I want to get or delete or create, and then whatever resource type you want to have. So if you want to look at the pods in your, your cluster, you just go kubectl get pods and you'll get a list of pods too. If you want to get a specific pod, you do kubectl get pod, and then the name of the pod. You get information about that specific pod. And that's the same thing for every single resource. If you want to look at a service, kubectl get services. kubectl get service, my service. And also, you don't need to know the plural of things. It actually, you just need enough characters for it to be unique. So you can get, go and write kubectl get po, my pod. So kubectl get who. Uh, which is just not a good thing. It also has another cool thing, and that's we rarely use kubectl to do imperative commands towards the cluster. We don't go and say, go and run a pod for me. Even if you can, we don't. We use YAML files with our desired state configuration. So we can tell kubectl that we can do create or apply. What's the difference? Hard to say, always use apply. <laughs> apply works in all scenarios, create only works in some scenarios. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Dash F, and then you give it a YAML file. Then it will read the YAML file and <laughs> post that up to the server, and the server will make that your desired state. All of a sudden, there will be pods and things running in your cluster, and it's going to be magic and unicorns and all that. It also has one really cool command, and that is port forward. This allows me, or us, to port forward a port on your local machine to a pod inside of your cluster. So in this case, I'm setting up port forwarding to my pod inside my cluster, port 88 on my local machine to port 80 inside my cluster. This is so ridiculously transparent that I did this a version of this talk a few weeks ago, and there was a demo that failed, and I couldn't understand why, because I couldn't see Docker containers running on my machine, even though I had things running in my cluster. It's not until the day after I realized I was actually connected to a, a, a demo cluster in Azure. But everything, had all of my demos, my port forwarding, everything works. So and port forwarding from my machine, not just from my machine to a pod on my machine. I actually did port forwarding from my machine through our computer network and office, through the internet, to Azure, inside of Azure, inside of the network, inside of my Kubernetes cluster, into my pod, and I didn't even notice the fact that it was just working. Doesn't happen very often when it comes to networking, in my opinion. But let's have a look at actually creating some stuff. So I have a little demo app that looks like this. Actually, the app I'm not going to show you because it's dumb, it's the Neko app, but it's just an app I need for you to demo, to demo containers. So it's, a, it's an ASP.NET Core application, I have it as a Docker container. You, I could go and run it in my cluster by basically running this command here, which is kubectl run dash dash generator run dash pod slash v1, web app is the name of my container, and then I have the image that I want to run. That would suck to have to write that over and over again. Uh, it used to be shorter, but then they made it this big thing, and don't do this, don't run it like this. What you do instead is you define your pod in a YAML file. That means that we can store our YAML files in source control, we can get versioning, we can see what has happened to our YAML file over time, we can see all the changes, we can see who made the changes and all of that. So we create this YAML file, and as you can see here I have an API version, v1. Different resource types are in different uh, API versions, and the API versions are not just v1 and v2, they're like v1 beta slash something else. They're all in different places. The simplest way is you go to Google and you write Kubernetes pod YAML example, and then you get an example, then you copy that, and then you just replace the things you don't like. 
That's the way that I do my animal stuff. I tell it what kind it is, so I'm going to create a pod. I give it some metadata, so I give it a name, uh, and I'm giving it a label. We can ignore the labels for now, I'll come back to that. But it's basically, I'm giving it a name, and the name has to be unique for that resource type. So in this case, there can be no pod in my cluster called web app. But there's not going to be, because my cluster is empty. And then I give the spec. So these are the containers that I want to run, and I'm only running one container inside of my pod in this case. It, the container is going to be called web app as well. You can name it whatever you want. It has to be unique within your pod. Image, what image am I running? Well, I'm going to pull down my tapes for devs image, web app image from um, Azure Container Registry. I'm going to pull it always. It's a way for you, so you're not pulling any images, right? When Docker, uh, when you're doing Docker, you do Docker login, you do Docker pull, and you do things like that. Now, it's actually Kubernetes doing the pulling for you. So you have to tell Kubernetes how often you want it to pull your images. If you do image pull policy always, it will always look up your image uh, against the container registry. Uh, if you don't, it will only do it if it's not available on the worker node that's supposed to run the image. I moved this into always because I <coughs> might have gotten tired of renaming this thing every time I did a change to it. It, 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 it had different versions over time. And then I got annoyed, so I just kept pushing the same image to the same name, so I didn't have to update this, and that caused some problems. So this is a nice little safety, but it's going to make it a little bit slower. Then you say, what ports am I using? Nope. What ports am I exposing? I'm exposing, exposing port 80. And I limit the resources, so I'm requesting 64 megs of memory and a quarter of a core. Uh, but I'm limiting it, saying that you can never take more than 128 megs of memory and half a core, which is bullshit. It's going to take more than half a core whenever it feels like it. But there are some limits built in. It's just harder to limit CPU than, than memory. And since I'm pulling from a container registry that is not a public one, so this image is not available for anyone to pull down, it's on my private repo, we have something called the image pull secrets. I'm going to come back to it a little bit, but it's basically you put your credentials for your container registry inside of Kubernetes so that every worker node in the system can get those credentials and log into that container registry with the credentials it's supposed to use so you can access the image. That is all I have. Then I'm going to go out here. I'm going to go to. I should have done this before, but I had about four minutes to prep. Uh, I think it's somewhere here. There it is. So we'll do kubectl copy couple apply dash f, and I'm going to not that that run that done. I now have. Can you, can you see that in the back? Make that a little bit bigger. This terminal, by the way, is awesome. It's available in the portal. It's Microsoft's new terminal uh, where you can do tabs and you can zoom and it's all cool. You want to use that. With that in place, I can go and say, go and say kubectl get pods. And we can see that I have one pod running. It's up and running right now. It's in running state. It hasn't restarted it. And I set it up 21 seconds ago. What we can do now is kubectl port, da port dash forward if I can spell, web app, that's the name of my pod, and I want to port forward port 8080. You know, I, I know I'm using 8080 in my, my slides and in all of my demos. You can choose whatever port you want. Nobody really cares. 8080 is just one of those that seems like it sticks. And, ah! Okay, I must only say that's not impressive at all, but it, it is working. Uh, and if you don't trust me, so this is a cool thing. I, it's running kind of locally on my machine, which is not quite true because Docker for Desktop runs in a, 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 a Linux machine inside of Hyper-V on my machine, but there's some magic sauce being sprinkled on top of it. So what I can do is I can actually go and pull up my trusty Docker command and do Docker PS, and you can see that case for devs actually, that's my, that's my app. That's my pod, or my container inside my pod. So, once again, Kubernetes is not running anything for you, but telling Kubernetes to run a pod that uses this uh, image causes it to talk to my Docker host and tell Docker to run the container for me, and thus it shows up in my Docker. And then we'll do um, kubectl delete, delete uh, pod web app. Um, it is now gone, and if you don't trust me, I'm just going to go ahead and refresh and show you that it's not responding. 
At some point, I'm going to do a talk where I'm just going to fake everything and run everything to IS and see if anybody reacts. I'm going to have tons of issues and errors in there, and it's still going to go, it just works, look at that, it's beautiful. And then at the end, I'm going to go, nope, I didn't show you anything useful. However, you do not set up pods manually. I just showed you what not to do. I showed you what to do when you're playing around with your computer at home, trying out new things and seeing if it works. The problem with running pods like this is, once again, just as with Docker, if you want to run multiple replicas and load balance it and all of that, then this would mean having to set up individual pods with individual names. And if you want to scale from two to three, you would need another YAML file with another name and redeploy. It's going to be suck. So what you want to use is replica sets. Replica sets are awesome. They allow you to, to load balance, but before scale, rather. But before we do that, there's one thing we need to learn. We need to learn about labels, because if you don't, that is going to end up. That gif is just so awesome. I just had to have that in one of my presentations. Can you imagine the pain of that guy? Ouch! Anyhow, labels. It was also kind of a warning. Please, you need to understand labels. Labels are very, very simple. They are key value pairs. They have a key, which is a string. They have a value, which is a string. They are key value pairs in string format. Okay? And you can label any resource in Kubernetes. You can label your nodes which is your worker nodes, your physical machines. You can label your pods, your services, anything that you put into Kubernetes can have a label, or many labels. The cool thing about that is that we define the labels. So our solution and our requirements define what labels do we put in there. We probably want to put in version labels and what type of app it's running and a bunch of other labels like that. But what happens is that the replica sets then use those labels to figure out what am I replicating? What is the set of pods that I want to run? So you tell the replica set that I want to run five pods, I want to run five replicas, and then you say, with these labels. So the pod doesn't, the replica set doesn't own any pods. It doesn't automatically set up pods necessarily, but what it does, it continuously monitors the, your rest endpoints or your cluster to see, are there currently five replicas of, a, of pods that have these labels specified? If there are only four, it will add a fifth. If there are six, it will decrease it to four and kill five and just kill one. But it's all about labels, which is a very, very flexible system because it allows us to do whatever kind of grouping of, of pods that we want. It also means, for example, I can have a replica set that would contain several different types of pods running several different types of images. And when you wanted to talk to one of those images, you could get re redirected to, to different kinds of images depending on Luck, basically. So it's powerful and scary at the same time. So let's have a look at running a replica set. So if I go back out here, I have a replica set defined for obvious reasons, because I can't type. Replica sets look like that. Not for API version, in this case, app slash v1. It's a replica set. It has a name. Once again, it has to be unique for the replica sets. Uh, but it, it has been unique within its own resource type. So you can have, I can still have a pod called web dash app, but it has to be unique for the replica set. It has a, a label, doesn't matter for the actual, actual replica set. I just put a label in there because, well, I felt like it. Or it might have been in the uh, example thing I downloaded from Google. Um, but then in the spec, it's now a little bit different. The spec looks a little bit different than the pod because it has a replica. So I can tell I want to run three pods, so the three replicas. The selector is, I want there to be three pods in my system that have the label app with the value web. You can do whatever you want in there. You can have much more complicated label selectors and, and expressions and things, but I'm going very, very simple. And then I'm saying I have a template. Here, you'll see that I'm actually using exactly the same temple, template that I use for the spec in my pod. So all I've done is I've basically taken my pod spec and pasted it into my template, and that means that if the replica set doesn't find enough pods, it will use this template to spin up a new pod for me. With that in place, I can go back to my trusty uh, terminal. We'll do kubectl apply dash f. Web app RS, there it is. Ooh, there's a big, big comment here that I should leave stuff running. Now we've got that. We can run another command called kubectl get all. 
It will give, get all of our resources in our cluster no role. It will give a, a all of a subset. It will give us all of our services, all of our uh, replica sets, and all of our pods, and a few other things if there are things in our, our cluster, but it won't actually give us all. The all is just bullshit. But what we're seeing here, replica set, web app, I want three, there are currently three running, there are three ready. I've got three pods up here. They're all ready, they're all running. I'm happy, I have three, three replicas, and I can go ahead and do port forwarding to them if I wanted to. But a kind of cool thing we can do is this, qctl get pods dash dash watch. So that will now be watching the current state of my pods. At the same time, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull up my terminal. Actually, I want to, I, can I get a, uh, we can do this, let's do that. Create another one of these. I want you to see both of them at the same time. If I do that, that's going to just do this. Okay. Then we do a kubectl delete pod, and then let's just pull a random pod. Let's take this pod. You do not deserve to live. It's nothing personal, but you don't deserve to live. As soon as I kill that pod, you can see that it goes into terminating, pending, pending, creating, terminating, running, running, terminating, blah, blah. As soon as the pod dies, the replica set will notice that there is one too few pods in a running state, and it will spin up a new one and go back to three. My web app F5FFWJ is gone dead and will never be resurrected, but there is another one, um, 5CH6H had no problem taking his place, or her place, I don't know. I don't know if pods are female or male. Uh, so, replica sets are kind of cool, and they allow us to run multiple instances of pods in a controlled manner. But now we have a problem. Because now we have multiple pods. How do we talk to a pod? How do I, how do I communicate with multiple pods? You can't communicate, you need to choose one pod. If I choose one pod, that pod disappears. How, what happens then? Well, you're kind of screwed. So, Kubernetes has something called services. Services can in the most basic case, give us a cluster IP address. It's a fixed IP address that belongs to the service, and whenever you try to talk to that IP address, it will redirect your request to one of the pods in the cluster. One or rather one of the pods that it fronts. So it uses a label selector as well to select the pods it should be responsible for, and whenever you talk to the service, it will take one of the pods in that label selector and redirect your request to that pod. Really, really cool. And that's the, that's the best, most common scenario. It also, besides the cluster IP, because we really don't want to be dependent on IP addresses, because that's just annoying, it also gets a DNS uh, entry. So every single pod in the system can find a service based on its name. So you just go and call the service name, and you'll get redirected to that cluster IP address, which prompts you to one of the useful pods. So if we look at a service, a lot of bouncing back and forth between PowerPoint and code, but let's do that. Very simple thing. I want to create a service. It's called web. Name here is really important because the name in the metadata here is the DNS record that I'm going to use to find it. So if I want to talk to any of the pods that this thing is sitting in front of, I just go hv colon slash slash web and I will end up at that location inside my cluster. It's what's called a cluster IP address. It has a selector saying that I am a service and if you call me, I should find a pod with the selector app uh, set to web. And I want to forward protocol TCP on port 80 to port 80. So we can do some port mapping as well. If you want to use different ports, that's fine. And you can use TCP and UDP, and you can have multiple ports as well being routed as well. But right now, very, very simple service, cool web, 80 to 80. But go back out here, we'll do that. We'll jump out to, to service, kubectl apply dash f. That didn't come up very well. There it is, cube, CTL, get all. We can now see that I have my three pods running. I got a new service here. There's always a service in your cluster called Kubernetes. That points to the Kubernetes API. So inside of your cluster, if you have a, a container that needs to talk to the API to make some requests, you can always just request Kubernetes. That will end up at the control plane. I got the service web here. It's got a cluster IP address, 1097.12838. I really don't care, it's IP address. But I cannot go into this. This is poorly documented for uh, different reasons. But you can do kubectl port dash forward 
service slash web, I think that was what I called it, uh, 8080 like that. Forward? Forward, like that. We go back out to this, refresh, I end up in my, my pods, and now I'm talking to the service, and then the service routes me to one of the pods. And if I refresh this, you'll see how awesome the load balancing is. It's actually a piece of crap, because it doesn't work. <laughs> load balancing doesn't work based on your service uh, out from outside the cluster. Uh, so what happens is that when I do port forward to a service, it just goes ahead and looks at the service's endpoints, basically what ports is it fronting, takes one of those pods and port forwards to that pod. The reason that it has to do it like that has to do with networking, and networking is hard, and there's proxy stuff involved. So if I were port forwarding this, and I happen to kill the one called web app tk7wx, my port forwarding would fail, and I would have to restart it. So you don't necessarily get load balancing when you do port forwarding, or not even necessarily. You will never get port forwarding with load balancing. It just doesn't work. But you can try that if you wanted to put forward to a service just to see that it works. Then we'll do kubectl delete dash f. So I can pass in the same YAML file again with the delete command. It will delete everything that is in that YAML file. And I'll do kubectl delete. And the one I wanted to delete was re a replica set called web app. Like that, it's gone. My cluster is now empty. That's it. So good. Okay. Services are a bit more complicated. There are four or five different versions of services, all doing different things and, and so on. This is the most simple version of it. You've also got something called ingress controllers, which is what I would call services on steroids. So they are smarter in the way that they will do the same thing as a service. They will, they will front other pods or front other services. But instead of just allowing you to do port mapping, it can actually work on the, the uh, HTTP layer. So you can look at your incoming request and say, if you are going to slash X, then you should go to this service. If you go to slash Y, you should go to that service. If you've got this header turned on, then you should go to this beta version of your site or whatever. So the ingress controller is just much smarter than a service. It doesn't just do port to port. It actually uses HTTP to figure out where to route stuff. You've also got something called deployments. This is where you should be doing, or it should be working. You should not be using replica sets either. I did tell you not to do pods, and you should use replica sets instead. Now I'm saying you shouldn't do replica sets, you should do deployments. I'm a shifty person, I know. <laughs> deployments will create replica sets in the same way that replica sets will create pods. And then those replica sets will create pods, or rather that rep, 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 well, semantics. Um, so why is deployment important? Well. You deploy a whole deployment, then the deployment causes a replica set to be created, the replica set creates pods. But the cool thing is that with a deployment, you can do rolling updates. So if you change your deployment and say, I have a new version of my pod or a new image that I want to run, when you do an update in a deployment, you can do a rolling update and say, tell it to take down a few pods at a time and pull up this, the pods with new versions in it so that you have a mix of old and new pods and very, very, uh, very very sure, no. Verify that they allow, they, they work. So your new version is actually up and running. It will start routing a bit of traffic there. It will see that it's, it's alive for the number of seconds you define before it rolls out the rest of your pods in the system a few pods at a time. Because replicating failures throughout a cluster is really not a good idea. So deployments go one step above and say, I will help you with the rolling update by basically removing a few pods at a time and replacing them. And if everything is fine with those pods, I will do the same thing again. And if those are OK, I'll do it again, based on the idea that you have more than one pod. Because if you only have one, then it's not going to work. But if you have 20 pods, or 50, or 100, then doing five at a time might cause you not to take down your entire application. So if we look at rep deployments, I'm not actually going to uh, show you how to do a rolling update, but I will show you a deployment. And that includes another little interesting thing. Because uh, this deployment here, it's a deployment. It has a name, it has a label. It's, the spec is pretty much the same spec as a replica set, because that is what it's actually creating. It's just that the, the, the deployment is kind of a virtual thing put on top for management purposes. It's not something that actually exists. So the spec becomes your replica set spec. 
But what I'm also doing in here is I'm setting up some environment variables so that I can communicate with something with a Redis instance. As I'll come back to configuration. But adding three dashes inside your YAML file means that, hey, this is one spec, now there's another one. So you can put multiple specs in the same file. So in this case, not only am I doing a deployment, I'm actually putting up a single pod as well. But Chris, you said we shouldn't do pods on their own. No, we shouldn't. It's a demo. Just, the reason that I don't want to do a replica set for this is a Redis pod being used for caching is not really great if you have multiple replicas on the, of them, unless they're actually connected into a, a Redis cluster, and I don't want to set that up. So I'm running one stupid Redis uh, pod for me as well, on port 6379. And then I'm creating a service called Redis. So that's going to be my way to communicate with the Redis pod. So from my web app, I can go and ask Redis um, at, at the name Redis. And I have a service which is for the web, but in this case, it's going to be something called a node port. So a cluster IP service becomes a, a fixed IP address in your cluster with a name, and node port actually selects a random port on the host, my machine in this case, and port forwards that port on the host to your container. So if you wanted to use node ports to communicate with your cluster, if you set up one of these, it means that every single worker node in your cluster will have a random port assigned that will redirect to a specific pod or a specific set of pods. And then you can put a load balancer in front of that, and then all of a sudden you have a cluster that you can read from the outside using a load balance environment across different nodes. If I run that, let's do deployment. QCTL uh, apply dash F. There it is. QCTL get all. There it is. I've got uh, a few pods. Oh, oh that was hard. Uh, I got a few pods up and running. I got a couple of services. I got a web app, a web app and running. One out of three ready. Let's try that again. Three out of three up and ready. And I have a replica set with desired account and all of that. That's kind of cool. If you look at this now, you see service web is a node port and it says 80 colon 30,405. That is the random port on my machine or on the worker node that it has selected. So every single worker node in my cluster will have that port bound to port 80 on that service. If I go back out here and I do localhost, random ports, I end up inside my cluster. And it's, it, it kind of load balanced once. Don't, don't ask about the load balancing, it's just indeed. It, it needs a bit more load than that to be load balanced properly. Um, so that's kind of cool. And so now I have, I have a bunch of things up and running in my cluster, and it was just one YAML file. If I ever wanted to make a change, I could just go in here, change my deployment, and do another apply. And I can use the same file with all of these things in there, because when I do an apply with the same file again, it will find all the differences, all the changes I've made. So most of my resources would stay the same. It would see a change in my deployment, and then it would do a rolling update across my three nodes, or my three pods, rather. Sorry. So, that's kind of how you get running. It's not that hard. It takes five minutes to try out things. I'm, I'm currently writing a, a pretty ridiculously long intro to Kubernetes on my blog, and like every blog post is about that long. But the cool thing is, every little thing I want to show, I should try, dry run and try all the code, and every little thing takes about two, three minutes to do. Oh, I want to see if this works. Little YAML file, little YAML file, couple of applies. Oh, it worked. Cool. No, it didn't work. Try change this. Cool. Every little thing takes about two to five minutes to try out in small scenarios, which makes it a lot of fun just sitting there trying little things quickly instead of it takes 16 minutes for me to deploy into my production, blah, blah, blah. So what else do we need? Well, we need configuration, we need storage, and we need health monitoring. Those are really important things in our cluster. For configuration, uh, if you've ever run Docker, you know that Docker uses environment variables or you can mount volume mounts into your Docker containers to get configuration in there as files or as environment variables. That is kind of cool, because all we need to do is change the logo up there, and you know how to do it in Kubernetes. The main difference is where you find the values. So instead of hard coding them like you do in Docker in your in Docker file, uh, or when you set up your container, you actually put in what's called a config map, which is another resource in your cluster. And that resource map, or config map, contains a, a Key value pairs. So basically, in this case, there's a timeout and there's a string with 00, 0 colon, 0, 05 colon, 00, 00. That value is placed into the cluster as a config map. You can have as many config maps as you want inside of the cluster, they're all named. 
And then when you create your pod, you can say, hey, can you set up the environment variable called timeout? And I want you to get the value from a config map called my config map. And I want the key to the, for you to read to be timeout, which means that the environment variable timeout inside of that pod will be set to that string up there. And that means that you can have your config maps in different clusters. You have a UAP cluster, you have a production cluster, you have a test cluster. You'll have different config maps, but you can deploy the same pod to every single place because the actual configuration is outside of your pod definition and inside of your cluster. You can also load up files. So in this case, I have a config map, which is a JSON file. And then down here, you can see that I create a volume based on my config map. And then I create a volume mount saying that, hey, can you add slash app slash config.json? Can you please read in this config map here? Or rather, get the config volume by config map, which is defined down there. And the subpath is config.json. So this is kind of cool. You can, you can do this in the Ethernet core, for example, where you have your config, your app settings JSON file. You have that, then you mount it in as app settings.production.json uh, inside of your uh, pod. It means that it's overwriting whatever is in app settings by default, so you can just map things in there. You've also got something called secrets. Secrets are for secrets. They are awesome. They are key value things. They work in exactly the same way as a config map. It's for secrets. It's for things like credentials. And the values inside of it is base64 encoded. Yes. For all of you who is not laughing now, then I, I pity you. Uh, no, I don't. But uh, base64 encoding is not encrypting, it's not hiding, it is in no way secure in any form or way, it is crap from a security point of view. The naming here is more about the intent. It's called a secret because you should have access rights, because you can have access rights inside of your cluster and say not everyone is allowed to read this thing here because it's secret, but it's not encrypted. If you want to have encrypted values, put them in key vault or something like that. You've also got a specific version called a, a pull secret. I showed you that. It's basically the secret that you use to communicate with your container registries. So if your, your images are placed in a private repo or registry, you need to give credentials for that container registry to Kubernetes. And you do that using this fantastic command. kubectl create secret docker registry, name of the secret, Docker server, Docker username, Docker password, and Docker email, and that thing you can do whatever you want with because it's not being used. And then you take that name of that uh, secret and you tell your pod that in your pod you manifest, say, image pull secret is this name, and then it looks up this to figure out what credentials to use. Storage, we need to store stuff. Uh, they are Docker volumes. So if you're using Docker and using volumes in Docker, this is the same thing. The main difference is that you don't map, and you don't map volumes from your host, instead you have all these providers that allow you to map different storage mechanisms into your uh, pods. Uh, so for example, if you're running in Azure, you can use an Azure disk or an Azure file, and you just configure it, and all of a sudden you can store things in blob storage. And uh, there's even automated ways of doing that in Azure for you see in a simple way, you've got AWS and a bunch of other things. And the last one is uh, health monitoring. There is something called the Lightness Probe, or Lightness Probes, for your containers. So each container can have something, it can be very complex, but the simplest version is, can you please do an HTTP get to this endpoint on that port, on this container, <coughs> wait three se seconds after the first release or first uh, deployment, do it every three seconds, and if it fails for more than three times, then please restart my container. So basically it pings it, and if it fails three times, then it restarts the container for you. Um, Failure means any HP status code which is less than 200 and more than 399. And you can, on your own, define what you want to verify to get it to be restarted. There's also something called readiness probes. If a readiness probes, they are configured in the same way, but if they fail, they don't restart your container. Instead, they get removed from the services that are fronting it. So if you return a fail a readiness probe, no traffic is going to get routed to that container or that pod. Uh, which means that if you have a pod that's working too hard, you can fail the readiness probes a couple of times, traffic is not routed there, you can figure out what needs to be done to get it, basically can work off a backlog of things it needs to do, and once it's back and says, hey, I can accept more requests again, it will just start 
not failing the probes and saying I'm okay, and then it gets put back into rotation. So it's basically a way of taking it in or out of load balancing rotation within the cluster in an automated fashion so you don't have to do it manually. That's it. I suggest that you actually go and play with this. Uh, it's, it's a bit addictive, or it was to me. I spent way more time on this than I've done on other technology in the, the last few months, or the last year. Uh, it's easy to get started with, so go and play with it. And if you have any questions, um, I'm on Twitter, and I'm going to be outside in our booth for the rest of the day. So feel free to come up and say hi. Thank you so much, everyone.